This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you to their store and they'll know I sent you there. Hello everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and today I'm continuing with my limited review of Akoria Lair of Behemoths. I've already looked at all the white and blue cards in this set, and today we're looking at black. Going forward, we're going to look at the rest of the cards. Also going to do a top 10 about the biggest bombs in the format, and an archetype guide, talking about every two-color pair and what they want to be doing in this format. Before we get started, I just want to remind you that this video is about limited. It's not about any other formats, just limited. That means draft and sealed and nothing else. I'm also only talking about cards that are in actual booster packs. So things like the buy a box promo and cards that appear in other products will not be talked about in this video. Additionally, I use a letter grade system to talk about cards in all limited formats. If you're not sure what my grades mean, you should see an explanation in the description below. All right, let's look at our first black card in Akoria, Lair of Behemoths. First up, we have Bastion of Remembrance, which for two generic and a black is an uncommon enchantment. And when it enters the battlefield, you create a 1-1 white human soldier creature token. And whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. This seems pretty nice. The Aristocrat's ability, that is draining your opponent every time one of your creatures dies, tends to play pretty well in Limited, since it makes your trades and chump blocks do a little something extra, and those are things that are just going to happen over the course of a game, and this adds a nice little bonus to that. It is nice that this even brings a 1-1 token along for the ride, letting you add to the board at least a little bit, in addition to getting this effect out there. If this didn't add to the board at all, it would be a little harder to be super interested in, but even if it didn't add to the board at all, it would be a pretty good card, because this kind of card does actually impact the board state right away, in the sense that suddenly combat has a lot of different things going on in it than it had before. So adding the token is nice. It does make it better than it would be anyway, but I do think it would be playable without it. Now, your deck probably has to have one of the three following things, or more ideally, all three of them going on for the Bastion to be at its best. You either need a bunch of creatures, a bunch of creature tokens, or a bunch of sacrifice effects. Getting all three of those things to happen isn't a huge stretch either. And we'll see in this video a few more creatures that definitely help you go wide to help the Bastion, and that's just in black. Additionally, there are also some sacrifice effects, so yeah, I think black decks will normally be able to play this and probably never cut the first copy, giving it a C+. And it's a card that probably gets even better in multiple copies, so that's something to keep in mind too. Next up, it's Blitz Leech, which for 5 generic and a black is a 5-2 leech at common. It's got flash, and when it enters the battlefield, target creature and opponent controls gets minus 2, minus 2 until end of turn. Remove all counters from that creature. This is a neat design. A 6-mana 5-2 that has flash and gives something minus 2, minus 2 is already a pretty good card. The high power here means it can come down and trade with some big boys, and the minus 2, minus 2 means it can kill something small. If you're keeping track at home, that's a two for one, and that's without taking into account the fact that it removes counters from the creature too, something that in this format could really have a huge impact. This costs six, but I think every black deck will want the first copy, and I think they should even value it pretty highly. Flash even has a bit of extra upside in this set because it's the blue-black archetype, I'm giving Blitz Leech a B-. minus. It's one of the better black commons. Next up, it's Blood Curdle. It costs three generic and a black for a common instant, and it says destroy target creature, put a menace counter on a creature you control. So we have keyword counters making their debut in this set. Uh, Blood Curdle is a great common. Four mana for instant speed kill anything is usually at least a B-, minus, and this permanently gives something lifelink, which is a pretty real thing to be doing. Sure, sometimes that upside won't mean a lot, but sometimes it will really matter. And when it's stapled to an already premium removal spell, I'm pretty happy about it. I'm giving this a solid B. It's also a really good black common. Next up, it's Boot Nipper, which for one generic and a black is a 2-1 beast at common, and when it enters the battlefield, you get to choose between a Death Touch counter or a lifelink counter, and then put that counter on it. A 2-mana two 2-1 two with lifelink and a 2-mana two 2-1 two with death touch are both usually Cs. This has the upside of being nice with mutate since it brings keywords along for the mutation. While that's relevant, I don't really think it does enough to get this anywhere above being a solid playable. A nice 2-drop you'll be playing, but certainly not one you should be going after early, giving it a C. 
Next up, it's Bushmeat Poacher, which for three generic and a black is a 2-4 human soldier at common. And you can pay one generic and tap it to sacrifice another creature. And you gain life equal to that creature's toughness. Draw a card. This is a nice activated ability. Cashing in creatures for cards is always a nice thing to have in Limited because it isn't unusual for some of your early creatures to become kind of useless as the game wears on, and this gives you something really nice to do with them. Gaining life and drawing a card is great. Anytime those two are put together, I'm pretty happy because the life you gain makes it more likely you'll be able to use that extra card you drew before you die. You can also use it in response to removal or on a creature who has been shut down by an aura. This can also be used to sacrifice creatures who are blocking and would die anyway. A 4 mana 2-4 isn't even the worst stats ever, and overall this seems solid in slower black decks. It also combos well with red threaten effects by the way, since the sacrifice only costs a single mana. I think there will be plenty of black decks that don't want this since it's grindy, but I think it's such a nice common in the more grindy black decks that I'm giving it a C+. It's going to be something you usually want one of in that type of deck. Next up, it's Call of the Death Dweller, which for two generic and a black is an uncommon sorcery. It says, return up to two target creature cards with total converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Put a death touch counter on either of them, then put a menace counter on either of them. This card has a cool design and is interesting enough that it definitely almost feels like it could be a rare. If you can consistently have creatures in your graveyard for this, it is going to be amazing. Three mana for two three mana creatures who each have a keyword ability counter is awesome. Now, this set has a graveyard theme, but it's not huge. We'll see some cards in this video that help you load the graveyard. Black green is really where you'll be able to do it at the very best. But even though this won't always have things in your graveyard, and sometimes it's going to be a dead card, it's also the kind of thing that in the mid to late game, when it always is getting back two things, which isn't that far-fetched, it's going to be pretty incredible. I mean, you're paying three mana for six mana worth of creatures and making them both better with their counters. So this card is pretty powerful, especially for an uncommon. In the end, I think this is a B-. I know it has a pretty reasonable, large downside in that it's going to be a dead card sometimes, but when you do cast this successfully and it does what you want it to do, it's going to win you the game pretty regularly. And for that reason, I think it deserves a B-. I think you want to take it early. I will say, you probably don't want more than one copy of this for various reasons. You know, it gives you a better chance of having a dead card, more than one dead card in the early game and things like that. But the first copy, I think you want to value pretty highly. Next up, it's Cavern Whisperer, which for four generic and a black is a 4-4 Nightmare at common. It has Mutate for three generic and a black, and that means you can cast it for this alternate cost and then put it over or under target non-human creature you own. They mutate into the creature on top, plus all abilities from under it. It also has Menace, and whenever it mutates, each opponent discards a card. So, a 5-mana 4-4 four four with Menace is usually probably close to a solid C. Uh, maybe more like a C minus. It will make the cut for you sometimes for sure, and that's the baseline here. It also has a solid mutate trigger, albeit one of the less exciting ones around, especially because its efficacy decreases as the game goes on. But hey, it can also lend menace to a creature it mutates onto, or you can use it as the creature on top to make a 4 4 menace out of one of your creatures. And menace is the black red archetype in this format, so that matters. But still, costing 5 to mutate for an underwhelming trigger isn't great, even if you're upgrading a creature at the same time. I think this is just solid, I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Chittering Harvester, which for 5 generic and a black is a 4-6 Nightmare at Uncommon. It can mutate for 4 generic and a black, and whenever it mutates, each opponent sacrifices a creature. So, Edict Effects may be extra good in a format with mutate, since people will be more frequently stacking a bunch of cards on top of each other. But Edict Effects can really let you down by the later part of the game, like turn 5 when you play this. It can also have a real effect, but I mean, is making a creature into a 4-6 for 5 mana while making your opponent sack something really that great? I don't think it is. Making your opponent lose their worst creature is pretty close to irrelevant on many boards. Sure, if you stack mutating, it can get sillier, but I'm still not in love with this. It doesn't seem that efficient, and the mutate payoff isn't amazing. Though again, probably better here than in most sets, but I'm going to start it at a C. Next up, it's Corpse Churn, which for one generic and a black is a common instant, and it says put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard, then you may return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand. This is a reprint from Oath of the Gatewatch, and this was fine there. 
That's about what it will be here. There is some graveyard action in this format that we've already seen, but it isn't like this is Theros. You won't always be able to take advantage of getting stuff into your graveyard. So a lot of the time, this is kind of just like a black anticipate, which isn't bad, but it isn't exactly something you really need to pull your deck together either. I think you'll cut it pretty often, giving it a C-. Next up, it's Dark Bargain, which costs three generic and a black for a common instant. And it says, look at the top three cards of your library. Put two of them into your hand and the other into your graveyard. Dark Bargain deals two damage to you. Another reprint, one I like a little more than Corpse Churn. It also does a little bit of graveyard stuff, but instead of just giving you some card selection, Dark Bargain actually nets you a card. This is kind of like Black's version of Scry 1, draw two cards. And, you know, it's not quite that good, admittedly, but I think that most black decks usually want to run one card like this that can help them find an advantage in the later stages of the game. I think this is a solid C. Next up, it's Dead Weight, which is one black mana for an enchantment aura at common. It has enchant creature. An enchanted creature gets minus two, minus two. Dead Weight's back. That's the third consecutive reprint, kind of funnily enough. Anyway, Deadweight is always premium removal. It often trades up since it only costs one mana and gives minus two, minus two. And in a pinch, you can even use it to weaken creatures who might be too large to die from it. That isn't usually ideal, but it is something that it can do in addition to just killing an X2. This is usually a B minus, and I think that's what it is here too. Next up, we've got Dirge Bat, who for two generic and two black is a 3-3 bat at rare. He's got Mutate for four generic and two black. He has Flash. He's got flying, and whenever he mutates, destroy target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls. This is really strong. I think in an ideal world, you hang on to this until you can pay the mutate cost. It's kind of like a 6-mana, 3-3 flying flash, ravenous chupacabra, but one that requires you to have a non-human creature in play. I'm willing to jump through that hoop, though, and it won't be that hard. In a pinch, you also have a 4-mana, 3-3 flyer with flash, which sometimes is just what you need. I think this will be hard to pass up since it is premium removal that comes with a sizable, evasive body, and I haven't even mentioned how silly it will be to mutate multiple times onto this. I'm giving this an A. It's a straight-up bomb. Next up, it's Durable Coil Bug, which for one generic and a black is a 2-2 insect at common, and you can pay four generic and a black to return it from your graveyard to your hand. This is a nice little common. He might just be a bear, but he is just the kind of thing you want in some long, grindy games, since this little bug can just keep coming back, assuming you have a ton of mana to pour into it. The coil bug is a fine play early and something you can get back late. Don't get me wrong, it isn't amazing at all, just right in my wheelhouse in terms of how I like to play magic, but he's just a C. Next up, it's Duskfang Mentor, which for two generic and a black is a 1-3 human cleric at uncommon. And when it enters the battlefield, you put a lifelink counter and target non-human creature you control. You can pay one generic and a black to put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control with lifelink. This whole cycle is pretty nice. Granting keywords to creatures who don't have them, especially big creatures, is going to feel good. And this whole cycle also has the ability to pump up creatures with that keyword including but not limited to the one that you put the keyword counter onto. That means these have an immediate impact on the board in most cases, and they also have late game value in their mana sync ability. They are generally all undersized for their cost, but they do enough in addition to that to all be something you're interested in putting in your deck and that you probably never cut. I'm giving this a C+. Next up, it's Easy Prey, which for one generic and a black is an uncommon instant, and it says destroy target creature with converted mana cost two or less, cycling two. The art on this one is really funny, uh, and this is a good use of cycling. Without cycling, this is probably like a D. Sure, it kills stuff at instant speed, but it is super narrow. Only destroying things with a converted mana cost of two or less, and that also means you generally won't be coming out ahead mana-wise. You can use it in response to your opponent mutating onto a small creature, but that often won't accomplish a ton since the creature that is doing the mutating will just enter the battlefield as a creature. Even at its best, this won't be all that exciting, it'll just be fine. Adding cycling to the mix is definitely relevant, because this often won't have targets. Most decks will likely have three to six things that die from this, and that's probably enough for this to be a C-, thanks to cycling. That means you'll cut it a decent chunk of the time, and you may want to sight it in against opponents who have really low curves. It'll be a little better there, but it's still not great. Next up, we have Extinction Event, which for three generic and a black is a rare sorcery, and it says choose odd or even. Exile each creature with converted mana cost of the chosen value. I don't know how I feel about this. It's nice that you get to make the choice here, because you can choose whatever is best for you. 
Most of the time, that will let you come out ahead, but board states where the impact is negligible won't be that uncommon either, and it isn't like you will always have even permanents and your opponent will have odd ones. In those cases, it would be amazing, but it has pretty random nature to it overall in the sense that you can't really determine what converted mana cost creatures are on the board. Still, I think in the end, the fact that you get to make the choice means you will come out ahead most of the time, but I think you also need to be prepared for it to disappoint you some of the time too, but still, the effect is irreplaceable. There's not a lot of things that can have this big of an impact on the board, even though this is kind of wonky. And for that reason, I do think it's a B- minus in the lower range of first pickable. You should definitely be taking the really high-quality uncommons and, you know, premium removal spells over it. But it's a pretty good card overall. Next up, it's Gloom Pangolin, which for two generic and a black is a 1-5 Nightmare Pangolin at common. Pangolins are pretty cute, but this one isn't anything special. A 1-5 for 3 might be something you play in slower, more controlling decks sometimes. It can block pretty effectively, but I think most of the time you won't really want this. And you'll play it when you're desperate for creatures, and that's about it. It is something you can mutate onto earlier in the game, but doesn't seem that great to me. I'm giving it a D. Next up, it's Grim Dancer, which for 1 generic and 2 black is a 3-3 Nightmare at Uncommon, and it enters the battlefield with your choice of two different counters on it, from among Menace, Death Touch, and Lifelink. This is a great uncommon. We've seen plenty of 3-mana three 3-3s three with just one of these keyword abilities be good. Getting a combination of two of them is great. Menace and Death Touch together are typically a nightmare for opponents to deal with. This thing will be getting in for lots of damage. Menace and Lifelink are pretty nice too. Basically all the combinations are, though I think Menace and Death Touch will be the best way to go more often than not. This is because your opponent has to double block it if they want to kill it, and no matter what they do, because this thing has Death Touch, you're going to get to kill both blockers. This is going to be one of the best uncommons in the set. I'm giving it a B. You'll first pick it frequently. Next up, it's Heartless Act, which for one generic and a black is an uncommon instant, and it says choose one. Destroy target creature with no counters on it, or remove up to three counters from target creature. I get it. This set has a lot of counters, so this won't actually be able to kill everything, but it will still be able to kill a majority of creatures for only two mana, and that's a pretty good Doomblade impression. On top of that, even if you end up in a situation where all your opponent's stuff has counters, it comes with another option that lets you take away those counters. Depending on the counters, that could sometimes act as a removal spell in a way because if something attacks you and you take away some keyword abilities or plus and plus one counters, an advantageous block may emerge. I do think most of the time you're hoping for a nice target to just straight up kill, but the fact that this has something else to fall back on in the worst case scenario makes it pretty nice. I think this is definitely premium removal and first pickable, even over most of the rares in this set. I'm giving it a B+. The comparison that I've been making is that, you know, Terror was really good in Mirrodin, a set loaded up with artifacts that also had black creatures in it, and yet Terror was still really good. I think Heartless Act will be good here, despite the fact that there's lots of counters around, it'll still be able to kill most stuff. And again, it has that nice fallback ability to remove counters from a creature if you can't do anything else. Next up, it's Hunted Nightmare, which for one generic and two black is a 4-5 Nightmare at rare. It has Menace, and whenever it enters the battlefield, target opponent puts a Death Touch counter on a creature they control. This is an interesting design. A 3-mana 4-5 with Menace is incredible, but the downside here is not insignificant. Giving an opposing creature Death Touch is not what you want to be doing. The good news is, because the Nightmare has Menace, your opponent will still have to double block for the Nightmare to die to the Death Touch creature. Black also has a good amount of removal, as we've already seen, and just making sure you can kill their Death Touch creature is another way to go. The ideal scenario, of course, is to play this when your opponent has no board state or only one small creature you aren't worried about. And that's what the case will be if you actually cast this thing on turn 3, and in those games it might just take over. I think the downside here is real, though, and later in the game it will have diminishing value, so I don't think I want to go after this early, even if the ideal scenario is awesome. It won't be what you get even half of the time. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, it's Insatiable Hemophage, which for 3 generic and a black is a 3-3 Nightmare at Uncommon. It has Mutate for 2 generic and a black. It's got Death Touch. And when it mutates, each opponent loses X life and you gain X life, where X is the number of times this creature has mutated. A 4-mana 3-3 Death Toucher is usually a C or C-, minus. being able to trade for anything, and the decent size is fine. And that's one thing that is nice about most of the mutate creatures. They all have very reasonable fail cases. The Hemophage can also drain the opponent every time you mutate, and in a format with the mutate mechanic in general, being able to staple Death Touch onto stuff will be nice sometimes. 
The mutate payoff here isn't the most exciting. The first time you do it, it won't be a big deal. If you can stack it, it seems pretty nice, but it also seems dangerous because you're opening yourself up to three and four for ones, which isn't really going to be worth it just to drain your opponent for two or three life. Overall, though, I think this is just a fine black card. I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Lurking Deadeye, which for three generic and a black is a 4-2 human assassin at common and it has flash. And when it enters the battlefield, you destroy target creature that was dealt damage this turn. These kinds of creatures are not normally something I'm very impressed with. That is, creatures who kill something that has been dealt damage. This is because oftentimes making sure you damage something is difficult. And sometimes even when you do, you have to give up a card to do it. So the window where this does something is not as high as you would like. However, this one has flash, and that means that you will be able to find situations where it does its thing more often than usual. And even if you aren't managing to kill something with the ability, sometimes just flashing in a 4-2 to kill their X4 is just fine too. I think setting up the Enter the Battlefield trigger here will be doable enough that this is a C+. I don't imagine most black decks cutting that first copy. One thing to keep in mind here that's interesting is that Lurking Deadeye does not say May. And that means if you flash this in without planning on trying to kill an opponent's creature and you have a creature who's been dealt damage that turn, it's going to have to kill it because it does not give you a May option and it doesn't say opponent. So that's just sort of a corner case thing to keep in mind so that you don't end up blowing up your own guy. Next up, it's Memory Leak, which for two generic and a black is a common sorcery, and it says target opponent reveals their hand, you choose a non-land card from that player's graveyard or hand, and exile it, cycling one. This is a way better coercion between the exile effect and the ability to go after the graveyard and cycling. Normally, three mana to discard a non-land card from your opponent's hand is like a D in limited. It's more of a sideboard card, really. The horrible thing about discard spells like it is normally that you find yourself not always being able to do something with them. This makes most coercion-like effects not very good and limited, but memory leak having cycling means it will always do something, even if it is just pitching it and digging deeper into your library, but doing that for one mana is a pretty good deal. Basically, this is a discard spell where you can hope that you're going to get something awesome out of your opponent's hand, but if their hand is empty, plan B isn't bad. For that reason, this seems like a solid card for black decks. I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Mutual Destruction, which for one black mana is a common sorcery. It has flash as long as you control a permanent with flash. As an additional cost to cast it, you have to sack a creature, and it says destroy target creature. So at its worst, this is Bone Splinters. That's always a solid card. Killing anything for one mana is nice, though two for wanting yourself to do it usually isn't. Where Bone Splinter shines is when you aren't really two for wanting yourself because you sacrifice something like a token, or better, a creature you took from your opponent with a threaten effect. Bone Splinters is a C in most formats, but this has additional flash upside. If you can cast this at instant speed, it means you can use it to sacrifice a creature who's the target of a removal spell, or block with a creature and then sacrifice it, and not to mention just being able to respond to things your opponent does with this removal spell that's normally a sorcery. So Bone Splinters always at instant speed would probably be a B-. minus. Obviously, won't always be doing that, though, and I think it's enough, though, to get it up to a C+. Next up, it's Mythos of Nethroi, which for two generic and a black is a rare instant. It says, destroy target non-land permanent if it's a creature or if green-white was spent to cast this spell. So, two and a black to destroy a creature at instant speed is a very good card and certainly premium removal. This comes with the additional upside of, if you are going straight up Abzan, you can turn this into almost Vindicate and destroy any non-land permanents, not just creatures. That's some serious power. Now, will it be super easy to go three colors? Probably not, but it will be doable. Still, I'm going to give this a B+. It's basically an easier to cast murder, with the caveat that it is probably a straight A in a deck that has no problem making this capable of destroying any non-land permanent. Next up, it's Night Squad Commando, which for two generic and a black is a 2-3 human soldier at common. And when it enters the battlefield, if you attack this turn, create a 1-1 white human soldier creature token. So if this was a 3-mana 2-3 who always gave you that 1-1, it would be a B-, probably. However, you do have to fulfill the raid trigger here to get that 1-1. And while that's not the craziest hoop to jump through, it won't always be worth it. A 3-mana 2-3 isn't the worst fail case, but yeah, I think this is a C+. Next up, it's Serrated Scorpion, which is one black mana for a 1-2 Scorpion at common, and when it dies, it deals two damage to each opponent, and you gain two life. This is an interesting, yet simple design. As a 1-2, it can block the human tokens in this set, and with the death ability it has, it creates a four-point swing in life. That's not insignificant. 
This is not a bad thing to sacrifice to various effects, nor is it a bad thing to mutate on too early, but it isn't exactly amazing in either of those cases either. I think this will make the cut enough of the time that it gets up to C-, but I think you'll still cut it a lot. Next up, it's Suffocating Fumes, which for two generic and a black is a common instant, and it says creatures your opponents control get minus one, minus one until end of turn, and you can cycle it for two generic mana. Another card, upgraded considerably by cycling. Giving your opponent's team minus one, minus one until end of turn will sometimes have a big impact, either because it kills their X1s outright, or you can use it to really mess up combat for your opponent, but about half the time, and maybe more, it doesn't do anything significant, and that's when you cycle it. A card that just did the minus one, minus one thing would probably be a D, but I think cycling upgrades this into the C- minus range. Next, it's Unbreakable Bond, which for four generic and a black is an uncommon sorcery, and it says return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield with a lifelink counter on it. There's a fair bit of reanimating in this set. We already saw one black spell that reanimates. There's also a black green uncommon that reanimates. So there's reanimating at the lower rarities here, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Anyway, we see five mana reanimates a lot, and they usually aren't that good. The problem is that you need something in your graveyard that is worth spending five mana to reanimate, and not all decks will be able to do that. Although I think this set will be able to do it more often than most, and normally this kind of card for me ends up being like a D plus or a C minus, a little better if you have a couple of bombs, of course. But I think Unbreakable Bond is going to be a little better in this set than this card normally is. For one thing, it also gives the creature lifelink. For another, there's lots of big boys that you can cycle early in multiple colors. Not just in black, not just in green, but in multiple colors. And if you're cycling away a 7 mana 7-7 seven, seven worm on turn 2, casting Unbreakable Bond on turn 5 is going to be a very real play and something that I think we're going to see a decent chunk of the time out of black decks. So cycling makes this a little bit better. It still has the downside of really needing you to stock your graveyard, which while it's a little easier in this set thanks to cycling, sometimes you're just going to have like a 3-3 in there and casting Unbreakable Bond to get that back isn't going to feel good. But there are going to be times where this just wins you the game thanks to the reanimation effect and all the big creatures you can cycle away. But I think you have to sort of put it in the middle, you know... It will sometimes be stuck in your hand and do nothing. It will sometimes win you the game. And then there's sort of a middle ground, which is probably what it'll do the most frequently, which is reanimate something and help you win a game. And I think all of that just makes it a C. Next up, it's Unexpected Fangs, which for one generic and a black is a common instant. And it says put a plus and plus one counter and a lifelink counter on target creature. This doesn't seem that great to me. As a trick, it gives a pretty mediocre stats boost, even if the counter is permanent. The best tricks drastically increase the chance of your creature winning in combat, and this just won't line up that way often enough. Lifelink permanently is something I can get behind, but I feel like this trick has all the usual risk tricks have without really being worth it. I'm going to steer clear of this most of the time. I'm giving it a D. Next up, it's Unlikely Aid, which is one generic and a black for a common instant, and it says target creature gets plus two plus zero and gains indestructible until end of turn. It's good to follow up a bad trick with a decent one. Unlikely Aid costs the same amount of mana, but it is considerably better than Unexpected Fangs in most situations. This is because it grants a keyword that guarantees, or almost guarantees, that your creature will survive combat. While the boost it gives is not permanent, two power and indestructible is going to make a wider variety of creatures win combat in a wider variety of situations. Because of indestructible, you can use it in response to removal and things like that too if it comes up. Now, this is still a trick, and I have a hard time ever really loving most of them because they're situational and somewhat risky, but this is a trick you'll play more often than you won't. I'm giving it a C-. Next up, it's Void Beckoner, which for 6 generic and 2 black is an 8-8 Nightmare Horror at Uncommon. It has Death Touch. You can cycle it for 2 generic and a black, and when you do cycle it, you put a Death Touch counter on target creature you control. So, here's one of these big creatures that you can cycle away early and then reanimate. Anyway, an 8 mana 8-8 eight, eight death touch would not normally be something I want to play. That's because it's just hard to get to 8 mana. But by adding cycling to this, it becomes much more intriguing. Cycling really lets you get away with playing stupid expensive cards, since if you can't cast them, you can always turn them in for a card. It's especially nice that this Beckoner also has a trigger with cycling. Giving something death touch at instant speed and drawing a card is pretty nice. Even if your creature still dies in combat, you end up netting a card out of this, so the fact is offset especially if you were trading a little guy who could previously only chump block for something scary on the opponent's side of the table. And yeah, the fact that you can play this huge creature in the ultra late game is nice too. I think this is a nice card for black decks, but not one you quite want to first pick. I'm giving it a C+. 
All right, our last black card is Zagoth Mamba, which for one black mana is a 1-1 Nightmare Snake at Uncommon. When it mutates, target creature and opponent controls gets minus two, minus two until end of turn. This is most definitely a card that needs a build around grade. The fail case of being a one mana 1-1 one, one is pretty ugly, so you definitely need to be able to do some mutating to make it worthwhile. The good news is, there is plenty of mutate in this set, and when you do get this trigger, which will frequently let you pick off small creatures, or even larger ones if you do it after combat, when you get that trigger, it'll be pretty nice, and offset some of the risks of mutating. But still, I think your average deck in this format will have a few cards with mutate, but that won't be enough most of the time for the Mamba. I think it's just going to be a D in your typical limited deck. If you can get six or more mutate creatures, then you're ending up in a place where you actually want to play this. I'm giving it a C plus in those situations. It's nice that it's a one drop that you can mutate onto really early that also probably kills a creature for you. Well, those are all the black cards in Akoria Lair of Behemoths. Tomorrow, I'll be back to talk about all the red cards. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch the rest of this set review and draft videos and stuff of Akoria still to come, don't forget to subscribe. If there's anything you disagree about in this video, let me know in the comments. And again, I'll be back tomorrow with my red limited review. Thanks for watching.